Good evening. Good evening. Can you all hear me? Right at the back. Good. I'm Tony Burton, the secretary of the society. And uh, before I introduce our speaker, just want to say a few housekeeping things. Could you all switch off or silence your mobile phones? There's no fire practice tonight. So if the fire alarm goes, the exits are at the back of the hall and here and here, and you go out the front of the building. I first met David Rosario when we took a party of you to Newcastle earlier last year. And uh, there was such great interest and questions that I thought it would be good to invite him up here. And it's fantastic to see so many people here tonight and in the overflow coming to hear him. David is an observational astronomer and his research focuses on the relationship between galaxies and black holes. He gained his doctorate at the University of Virginia featuring spectroscopy from the Hubble Space Telescope. He did postdoctoral research at the Universities of California and Durham. He's now a senior lecturer at the University of Newcastle and carrying out research on the observations from the James Webb Telescope. You probably noticed that in the past 18 months of operation, the James Webb Telescope has expanded its horizons to, in every direction. To the, it's viewed all the planets and the furthest reaches of the observable universe. David will tell us how and why this amazing telescope operates. Over to you, David. Hello, everyone. I'm going to start by following Tony's advice and turning off my cell phone. Step one applies to everyone. I must admit, this is a real privilege. I have not yet given a talk to as many people as I see here today. So thank you for coming. This is wonderful. Um, as Tony told you, I'm a, a faculty member at uh, Newcastle University. Uh, but my passion has always been astronomy, and I consider myself to be an observational astronomer first. So I'd like to tell you about what's currently keeping me um, passion, and that's the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a um, arguably one of the most influential scientific instruments ever made. Now, I might be biased. <laughs> in telling you that, but I'm gonna to try to convince you if I can. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is the James Webb Space Telescope. We can't see it because it's in space. And also it's so far away from us that there's no real way to take a picture of it. Um, so this is obviously an artist's impression. There are pictures of the James Webb Space Telescope taken while it was on earth, but they're not as pretty. Um, now, there's something very important to notice from this first picture, which is the way the telescope is oriented in space. That was done on purpose. The, the fact that it's bright in one corner of this image and dark on the other is important. The telescope is blocked from the sun. What you see here, the big shiny thing there, is not the telescope's optics. It's a giant umbrella. It's a sunshade. And the sunshade protects the telescope, the big golden thing, and its instruments from the sun. The sun is the killer for the kind of science that's done with the James Webb Space Telescope. And I'll try to tell you why. Before we go to JWST, I just want to give you a little background about me, because I'm here telling you about this, and I want you to trust me. <laughs> um, so I'm from India. That, that uh, what you see in the corner over there, the, the left hand topmost corner, 
uh, is, is are coffee beans that my father grows in his coffee plantation in, in, the, in Southwest India. Uh, I don't do coffee. I drink a lot of coffee, but I don't actually grow it. Instead, I've decided to become an astronomer uh, over a long path. Uh, and what you see here, this, little, this video, uh, is one of the joys of being an observational astronomer, which is working with some of the most incredible technology that exists on Earth. That is um, what you see there are a bunch of telescopes in domes at the very large telescope in Chile. And shining from one of those domes are four lasers pointing into space. The reason why those lasers are attached to that telescope is because using those lasers, uh, astronomers can correct for the motion of the atmosphere. Looking out into space from Earth involves looking through a very turbid layer of air, which makes effects the way that we see the universe. So if we can correct for that as much as possible, then we can get a clearer picture of the universe. And that's what those lasers are doing. They're pointing out into space and correcting the effects of the atmosphere while not in an active fashion, in a passive fashion, while the, the, the uh, astronomers use the telescope to look at that part of the sky. This is incredibly advanced technology. It's widely used now. Astronomers have been using it for a good part of 30 years. It's called adaptive optics. And as an astronomer, we get to use this kind of uh, technology regularly. So it's been a privilege being an astronomer of all the number of years that I've been an astronomer. I worked with some great teams. That's, that's my research group when I was in Durham. And I've been to some lovely places like the Bavarian Alps, uh, where I had a stint as an observer as well. And now I'm at Newcastle University. And I'm proud to say Newcastle is my home. Uh, I will stay in Newcastle as long as I can. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Newcastle University's astronomy group, because it's relatively new. Our first astronomer was hired in 2019. We have grown quite a bit since, and we have a nice little group of people who study active galaxies. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you will know what an active galaxy is. Uh, I, in particular, want to highlight my collaborator and postdoctoral scholar, Stephanie Campbell. They are from Glasgow. So we have a very direct connection there uh, to, to this wonderful city. Uh, as you can see, we're young, we're diverse, uh, and it's a real joy working at Newcastle University. So if you, you know, are visiting the area and you want to talk to people, just let me know. You're always welcome. Another connection to, to, to you, in fact, is that our group is based in the Herschel Building in Newcastle University, one of the tallest buildings on campus. The Herschel Building is not named after the famous uh, uh, British German astronomer William Herschel, but instead his grandson, Alexander Herschel, who was the first professor of physics at Newcastle University, and also has given several lectures as part of the series in the 1870s, right? So going all the way back. So that's an interesting connection as well that, that Tony just told me about while, uh, while I was talking to him earlier. Uh, so I'm very proud to be walking in Herschel's footsteps in many ways by, by giving this talk. Right, let's move on to real astronomy, shall we? Um, this lovely uh, brochure here uh, documents something called the Next Generation Space Telescope, okay? It's worth looking at the date of this, 1989. The Next Generation Space Telescope in 1989 turned out to become the James Webb Space Telescope of today. Why was it called the next generation? The, the space telescope that you are more familiar with, the Hubble Space Telescope, right? Possibly, uh, you know, an iconic telescope over your lifetime, potentially. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched in, in 1989. So they were looking at the next thing. The next thing was gonna be James Webb Space Telescope. In 1989, People came up with the concept of the space telescope, and it was launched, as you know, two years ago. Uh, that's how long it takes for large astronomical um, facilities to be built and mature 
It's, this is not something that happens quickly. The technology is usually far in the future. People plan ahead. And this is a one-off. You make one of these telescopes and that's it. You don't get a second chance, right? So it's, it's quite a unique approach towards building something so complex and so um, uh, advanced. The early, early ideas for, the, uh, for JWST at that point called the NGST were uh, <laughs> remarkably terrible. Um, you know, they, they look like these large uh, tubes, large, I, I don't know, tubs within which you would place a telescope. And, um, you know, thankfully it looks nothing like that now. Uh, you will see why they thought about doing it this way as I describe the telescope in a little more detail. Now, 10 billion years uh, and uh, 10 billion dollars and 26 years in the future, JWST is a reality. It is an international effort. Every little spot on that map is an institution that has been involved with JWST. And if you look closely, you will see that Edinburgh is one of those institutions, and so is Durham University. Uh, there's a number of institutions in the UK that have played a role in JWST. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about, um, just recall the day that JWST was launched. I don't know if any of you were paying attention, but I definitely was. Um, for, and you'll see why. Um, that, that's the launch there. It was uh, an Ariane 5 rocket, which thankfully is a very stable uh, launch platform. What you see the little video here is JWST flying away, moving away from its, its final third stage, uh, uh, you know, connection to the rocket and, and flying out into space. At this point, it's moving fast enough that it's going to escape Earth's orbit. And what I just want you to, 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 to notice as this video progresses is it catches a glint of sunlight when that happened, my brother-in-law, who was watching this with me, immediately assumed that it was exploding. Um, thankfully, it wasn't. But the beautiful thing is that solar panel expanding. That was our last view of JWST before it went out on its own. Uh, while that happened, I was having goosebumps. That was my celebratory drink right there, uh, Christmas Day. Uh, Brew dog, another Scottish connection, right? <laughs> um, and it was just an astounding moment seeing this happen. Um, let me fill you in with little, some more detail uh, as to my personal connection to JWST. Um, in 2015, there was a meeting that, uh, organized uh, by the University of Edinburgh, the uh, UK ATC, uh, Astronomy Technology Center is based in Edinburgh. They have built one of the key instruments on JWST. So it's a very close and detailed connection between Scottish universities and the James Webb Space Telescope. They organized a meeting and I went because I wanted to figure out what, was, what this is all about. At this meeting, let me just show you a quick picture of the ATC if you want. Sure, this is at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh and it's, it's in fact these, these newer buildings there in the background. While I was, I was at this meeting, I met a number of other astronomers, and we decided that JWST would be the ideal tool to do something that has not been done before, which is to study in exquisite detail the centers of nearby galaxies where supermassive black holes are growing, and in particular to, to get a completely unique uh, and extremely clear view of the processes that are happening there. And so we, we put together something called GATOS, the Galaxy Activity, Taurus and outflow survey, uh, just a small number of people with, with combined interests, and, uh, and it sparked, sparked off. We had uh, five years of preparation, uh, and we worked very hard, and then we were really lucky to be among the first people to be given time on the James Webb Space Center, and I was one of the people leading uh, the, one of those two programs that got time through GATAS. Um, so, that is exactly why I was on tenterhooks on that Christmas day. Because if anything had happened to JWST, well, the next how many decade of my career would have had to be something else, right? You know, I was really dependent on that working out well. 
Uh, thankfully, Gartos has actually done really well in terms of uh, building on its, its connections to JWST. So in fact, we've, we've been collecting more and more data. There's cycles of, of, of what's called proposals where you ask for time. We were successful the last cycle. We've applied for a bunch more. So we hopefully will keep collecting these, these advanced data sets for, for our kind of work. And we're very happy with, with how things look. Right, so let's get down to JWST in more detail. On the right is the Hubble Space Telescope, a telescope that presumably some of you are familiar with. Um, on the left is JWST. They're actually not that different in size, right? In terms of overall size, they're just about, they're not that widely different. But the shiny bits are extremely different. And it is the shiny bits that matter for telescopes. Those are the optics. That is the eye. That, that's what collects light from the universe and then puts it into the instruments that act as the, uh, the observers, essentially, at this telescope. So you have uh, this little thing here. That, that is a two and a half meter mirror, which is the eye for the Hubble Space Telescope, roughly my size. And then this is the telescope uh, optics for J JWST, six and a half meters you know, about the width of this room, right? Much larger. And also those colors are accurate. It is gold plated. Now that seems like a very Trumpian thing to do. Why would you gold plate a telescope mirror? It turns out there's a particularly good reason for that. Again, I'll tell you why. But the basic idea is that JWST does not look at the world in the light that we see with our eyes. And in that special kind of light, Gold is king. Gold is much better at reflecting light at those wavelengths, which I'll briefly tell you about. Um, gosh, this is a, a longish movie. I'm gonna let it run for a little bit while I talk through, talk through uh, the, the basis for this movie. So this movie shows you what happened to JWST after it was launched. We couldn't observe this happening. And the reason is simple. If you look here in the corner of this movie, this, is, this tells you how far the telescope was when all of this activity occurred. That's the Earth. Uh, I believe that's the orbit of Hubble. And that's the moon, obviously not to scale. And this is the telescope on its way out. So by the time all of this was happening, all of this unwrapping and unrolling, the telescope was already past the orbit of the moon and on its way out from Earth orbit considerably. Um, so obviously we couldn't take a look at it. We didn't have astronauts flying alongside to take pictures of this un unfolding. We had to basically do these artist impressions. Now just look at how complicated this process. Right? The telescope couldn't fit inside the rocket, it's too big. So it had to be folded up like Oregon. And we're not talking here about a dish antenna. We're talking about something so precise that if, if it's off by a micron, it wouldn't work properly, right? And so they had to wrap this tiny thing up, put it into a gigantic rocket, send it far away and unwrap it to the accuracy of a micron. Right? If any of these elements fail, the telescope would have been a big expensive chunk of metal and gold in the sky with absolutely no, pretend, no scientific use. There were about 300 plus single point failures for this to, uh, in, in the process of unfolding JWST. It took six months of very slow very careful, very well-planned uh, deployment for JWST to turn into what it is. Now, what you see here is the expansion of the sunshade. This is the thing that kept the telescope away from the sun. I'll tell you why it does this very soon, uh, but you can see that it, it, it you know, it, it, this is a large expanding structure, roughly the size of a tennis, tennis court that, that had to be pulled out in space. Um, I can move this along a little faster. The technology to do that, I think, here. Um, 
So let me just, we can just jump ahead and take a look at the, the, the telescope optics opening up, right? Um, let's do that, let's do that. Yeah, there we go. So now you see that the, the mirror itself was folded into three, the mirror had to be unwrapped. And then that gave you the final you know, telescope that you see now. Notice we're well past the moon now, and we're on its way out. This is when JWS was fully wrapped 18 days after launch. And then it sort of slows down and turns into sort of something stable. It stops essentially as it goes out. Uh, the, the telescope was placed in a very unique point. That point was called, it's called the second Lagrange point. Why would it be kept there? Let me just stop here for a moment because I think this, this brings up, not here. This brings it more clearly. Oop, that's not what I meant. Let's begin, go all the way there. Zoom back a little bit. Yes, perfect. Okay. So this point here, the Lagrange point, is unique because this is a stable point. At this point, the, the Earth's pull and the Sun's pull are balanced out. So anything placed at this point stays there. That's why they sent it a million miles away. They put it at a point where, without doing much work, you can keep the telescope poised. If you don't do much to it, it just sits, relaxed at L2. Um, so it's an excellent place to put a telescope because then you don't have to spend a lot of money you know, and, 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 and propel it, zooming it around to keep it you know, pointing at things in the sky. Um, in reality, it's not exactly at that point. It actually moves around in, a, in what's called a holding orbit. So just wait, and that will come be clearer to you. Um, so that's the way the telescope moves around in space. It moves around in a large circular orbit around L2. And that allows it to point away from the sun the whole time. So notice the telescope is always pointing away from the sun, right? That's the crucial uh, element for JWST. Hubble didn't do that. Hubble's in Earth orbit. It couldn't point away from the sun. Now, this tells you why all of those shenanigans were put into place. What you see here are a bunch of numbers, but the numbers I want you to pay attention to are the differences between this side and this side. The hot side, the side facing the sun, a balmy 25 to 50 degrees Celsius, all right? Quite nice, you know? If there was some atmosphere there, we would consider it tropical. Unfortunately, there's no atmosphere, so you lose all your heat immediately. But on the other side, the side with the telescope, minus 236 degrees Celsius. And just for context, between this point and that point of the telescope is about the height of a man, height of a person like me. It's like my feet are at 50 degrees and my head is at minus 236 degrees Celsius without a refrigerator, <laughs> okay? No liquid helium, no liquid hydrogen, whatever. Nothing like that, passively, just because there's a sun shield. That sun shield takes all of the heat that falls onto JWST on one side, radiates it away, away from the telescope, so that by the time the telescope gets to where it is, by the time that heat gets to it, it can only raise the temperature of the telescope to be about 30 degrees above absolute zero. Why would we do that? Why would you try to do all of this? Because of what JWST is. It's an infrared telescope, okay? That is the key bit there. JWST does not look at the universe in light that we can see with our eyes. It is specifically designed to look at the universe in the infrared. And this is just a very simple, some of you may know about the electromagnetic spectrum, some of you may not, all fine. There are all kinds of light. We can only see this tiny smidgen, this sliver of light. These are wavelengths of light we can see with our eyes. That's our famous visible spectrum, the rainbow. If you go to shorter wavelengths or more energetic light, you get the ultraviolet or X-rays or gamma rays. If you go to longer wavelengths, you start off with the infrared, which is a long range. Uh, then you go into the microwaves and the radio. This is all light. 
JWST looks at this part of the spectrum, misses visible. Hubble looks at visible light primarily. And this is the crux of all of this high technology. This was why it was the next generation. Hubble was te technology that we understood. It was technology that we used to because cameras, you know, uh, old telescopes designed to, to allow your eyes to use, to look at the universe. These were all designed for optical wavelengths. This was the first time we were building a gigantic telescope to look in light that we could not see. That's why we had to use different kinds of technology. Gold reflects infrared light really well, not so good in the optical. That's why it looks yellow. In the infrared, it's an extremely good reflector. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. Now, the, the problem with infrared light is, is this. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of uh, videos here. One's, these are both videos of me, right? One taken with a visible light camera, and that should look familiar. One taken with an infrared camera. So let's just proceed. I'm doing something very simple here, just raising two glasses of liquid water. They look exactly the same. What about the infrared, right? As you'll know, you know what, what you're going to see here, right? Radically different. One of them is, is, is water that's just a bit too hot to hold, and the other is water from the tap, which turns out to be quite cold. Um, the, the infrared light that comes out of things at different temperatures is radically different, okay? In particular, me, you know, roughly 30 degrees Celsius or so, all that water, which is about 50 degrees Celsius, that's really bright. If you had a telescope that was 30 degrees Celsius, it would be shining brightly in the infrared. It would be terrible to build a telescope that basically shines in the light that you want to look at the universe, right? The advantage of building an optical telescope is th that light is reflected light. The light that you see when you see the world around you not right now is light that's reflected off, off you and me. You turn the lights off, it's dark. Therefore, you go to nighttime, point your telescope at the sky, no reflected light, you can see the stars and the, and the galaxies out there. If your telescope was shining, inherently shining, produced its own light, you would not be able to see those, those galaxies because the telescope would drown them out. The lights in the telescope would drown them, out, drown them out. So that's why we have to keep that telescope so cold that it itself does not drown out the light of the universe that we want to see. It's exactly why JWST has kept so cold. Um, and, and what can you learn from the infrared? Remember, we're looking at cool things, right? What are cool things? You and I are cool things, okay? The stars that we see in, uh, in, in optical images of galaxies like this, those stars are shining at thousands of degrees Celsius. They are very hot. When you look at galaxies in your traditional wavelengths, you're looking at really hot material. With web, you're starting to look at the dust and the cooler stuff that permeates empty space, okay? This is the dust that we are made of. We are dust for astronomers. Planets, asteroids, the, 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 the cigarette smoke that permeates through space, essentially. It is literally carbonaceous cigarette smoke. The universe is full of cigarette smoke, unfortunately. Um, it's good we live on Earth. It's, it's soot that's it's spread out among the stars. And it shines because it's a few tens to hundreds of degrees Kelvin, um, if you're used to you know, those uh, units. And, and this is a picture of a galaxy taken with the James Webb Space Telescope. And you can see that all of this dark stuff in between the stars, these lanes of dust, that is the stuff that's shining here. You one-to-one, -one, you can see all these tendrils of dust. They shine in the web image. We are looking at the cold stuff in the universe. And that's why we, uh, a web is giving us a view that we've never, never really been able to get before. Why does it matter about this cold stuff? We don't come from the stars. Our origin, 
and in fact, uh, the origin of, of anything that could be tied to life requires cool temperatures, requires processes and chemistry that works in relatively cool environments, by cool by astronomical standards. And this is the stuff that we're made of. We are seeing the stuff that becomes planets, life. We need to see it, and that's why web exists. Just looking at this, you can automatically figure out what's going on in this galaxy. Where you see big bright patches, that's where uh, the dust is hot. That's why it's shining bright. That has higher temperature, and that's where stars are forming. Just by looking at a web image, you can figure out where stars form. You don't have to do anything else beyond look at how bright the light is from a part of a galaxy. Um, another thing you can do with infrared light, this is not an infrared, a, 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 um, a, a, an image from web. This was taken from the ground, but I just wanted, I, I like this because it gives you a, a view on things that you're familiar with. That's our picture of the planet Jupiter, right? You see all these bands and stuff. You might have seen this through a telescope, right? What exactly are you seeing? If you look at the infrared image, it becomes obvious. The bright stuff corresponds to those bands. We know that bright stuff is warmer. And in a planet, when you see something warmer, that means it's further down because the planet's cool on the outside and warmer inside, just like our own planet. So in fact, just by taking an infrared image, you know you're looking into the planet when you look at those dark spots. You're looking down into the atmosphere when you look at the, the dark bands in Jupiter. You would not be able to know that unless you took an infrared image because the infrared image tells you how deep into the planet you're looking. I think that's quite nice. A couple of other videos for your fun. Um, <clears throat> so this also is perhaps something you might expect. You know, this is me hiding behind a, a plastic screen. And this is me doing the same thing with the infrared camera. You can easily see me through the, through, through the plastic screen. So some kinds of light can travel through Plastic, for example, you know, um, not all materials are opaque to all kinds of light. So that's useful. With the infrared, for example, we can look through dust. So when there's a screen of dust, almost like a dirty window, but astronomically sized, like in this picture here of this really iconic structure, right? The, um, the pillars of creation, the Eagle Nebula. Um, this is the Hubble image. This is the image with web. And notice all the stars. Notice this multitude of stars that you would never have seen before without web. Those stars pop up because in the optical, they're blocked by dust. But you look through the infrared, you see through that screen to the stars beyond. Okay? Another advantage of infrared astronomy. Um, and here's just a, a classic example of an object seen by web, and this is what it looks like in the optic. It's completely dark. It's a dark nebula with web. You can see that it's this gorgeous uh, flow of a wind coming out from a star in the center here. There's a star here blowing a wind. The wind is normally completely blocked by dust, but because of uh, web's infrared capability, you can see through it. And this is something that you might not expect. Here's me. Walking, being a bit silly, right? Doing something silly. If you peer closely, you'll see that I'm actually standing in front of a, sh a sheet of glass. It's perspex. Perspex. What do you expect to see when uh, I do the infrared image, infrared video? Perspex is completely transparent in the optical. It's completely opaque in the infrared, right? So it works both ways. There are things that allow infrared light to pass through. There are things that prevent infrared light from going through, even though they look completely transparent in the optical. Why does this happen? Chemistry. Certain materials interact with infrared light and don't interact with visible light. That's what Perspex does. It, it, it absorbs infrared light. It does not do, uh, does not affect optical light the same way, right? Changes your whole view about the world sometimes, astronomy, completely. Um, so how do we use this? It turns out that some of the most interesting elements in the universe for light absorb infrared light. 
this is the problem we're dealing with today. The greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is caused by carbon dioxide, water, and methane, a few choice chemicals in the atmosphere, absorbing the light that's radiated off the earth and keeping it within the atmosphere, okay? That's a problem, but we can use that fact to, to learn something about other planets, exoplanets, planets that exist out there in the universe orbiting other stars. Here's an artist's impression of an exoplanet. Here's examples of exoplanets that we know of, except we've never actually seen any of these. These are all artist's impressions. We postulate what these planets are made of, how big they are, what their atmospheres are made of, but it's very hard to understand what, what, they're, what they're doing. And that along comes Webb. What I'm showing you here is uh, a, a very interesting kind of data that you might get from Webb. So here's a star, right? And here's a planet going around the star. And if the planet is just placed at the right orbit, periodically, it crosses the star. We call that a transit. And when it crosses the star, two things happen. The light of the star is diminished just a little bit but we can measure it depending on the size of the planet. More importantly, the light from the star passes through the atmosphere of the planet and comes to you, right? So you're looking through the thin atmosphere of the planet through the star. And then periodically, the planet goes behind the star. <laughs> it's completely blocked. What you can do is take a look at the star when the planet is in front and when the planet isn't, subtract the two and you're left with the light from the planet. <laughs> Sorry for that. It's very hard work because we're talking about a very, very small difference in, in light, but it can be done. And when you do this kind of work with Hubble, so this is wavelength, incidentally, and this is the amount of light that goes through. When you look at Hubble, you, you, sort of, you have a couple of few features which are interesting. But if you go into the regime of light, the infrared that's covered by JWST, suddenly a whole bunch of these really interesting chemicals show their, their face. They start to affect light. Remember, they absorb light. So if you have a dip here, that means you're looking at light that's absorbed by these chemicals, water, ozone, methane, carbon dioxide. These are the chemicals that are related not just to planetary atmospheres and all that fun, Life, water. Can we find water around other planets? That's a key question for us to understand the formation of life. And Webb allows you to do it. Not only does Webb allow you to do it, Webb has done it, right? JWST has found water around the atmospheres of other uh, planets. It's not a theory theoretical thing now. The features that you see here measured in this, in this real spectrum that comes from JWST includes the features of water shown here in blue, <laughs> uh, the features of carbon dioxide in red, the features of um, well, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So you, we, we've been able to identify these chemicals in the, the atmospheres of other planets with Webb. And this is just a start. Webb has 20 years to go and it's gonna continue taking data. So there's a lot to learn about exoplanets. And uh, another thing that we have just been able to do, this is also one of the reasons that Webb was designed, was to try to see planets around other stars. Now, the difficulty is that we're trying to find a, something that's fainter than a, uh, a glow worm next to you know, a, uh, the, the light from a, um, a, a floodlight in a stadium. Right? It's an extremely faint, object next to a really bright star. How do we deal with it? High technology, there's something called coronog coronography, which is built into some of the instruments in web. And that allows you to take out the light from the star. So around this particular star with its phone number, HIP65426, uh, there is a planet that orbits and is just far enough away and bright enough that if you carefully block out the light of the star, you can see the light of the planet. And this is what you see in this image here. They don't look very uh, spectacular, but there is actually supposed to be a star here. The light of the star has been taken away using technological magic. 
and you can see the light from the planet at different wavelengths. Once you do that, measure the light of the planet, you can do real interesting things. You can figure out its composition, you can figure out its chemistry, you can do all kinds of things that we could not do with before. Uh, so coronogra coronogra coronographic imaging of exoplanets is something that is that web is designed to do and has done and will continue to do. Now, let's go to the area of science that I find the most interesting, which is um, galaxies. I'm a galactic, extra galactic astronomer. And, and web was designed for two, two things, exoplanet science, which I've talked to you about, and finding the first galaxies that ever formed, right? Looking back to few hundred million years, which is how long it takes to build a galaxy, after the Big Bang, and seeing the light from those first galaxies. Remember, we are now 13.6 billion years after the Big Bang. So we're looking at a little bit of time at the very beginning and trying to find the first glimmers of light, the first galaxies that ever formed. This is a huge question for us, right? Those galaxies contain the first stars. Those stars formed every element from lithium onwards including carbon, including oxygen, including nitrogen, including everything except hydrogen in your body has come from those stars. And we're looking at the first enhancement, the first enrichment of the universe when we find those galaxies. It's crucially connected to who we are, not just faint glimmers in the distant cosmos. It is where we come from. And it's very hard to find these because they're faint and something else. This is why it's hard to find. Again, I'm showing you the range in wavelengths that are covered by the Hubble Space Telescope, the previous best thing, and the James Webb Space Telescope, right? If, if you like numbers, this goes to just past a micron in wavelength, and then this is 10 microns or so. So this is called the mid-infrared, and this is called the near-infrared optical. Let's look at what a galaxy looks like. So what, what I'm plotting here is the amount of light coming out from a galaxy as a function of wavelength. Okay, so a galaxy has, uh, you know, some amount of light in the optical, and then it starts to drop in the infrared. There's a number of interesting spikes. Those are um, features produced by gas in galaxies. Let's not go into any of these details. This is what a galaxy looks like. So it's pretty faint in the infrared. So, you know, uh, optical, optical um, telescope should be just fine. You know? As I told you, galaxies produce most of their light from stars. Stars shine in the optical, great. The problem is we're not trying to find galaxies today. We're not trying to find our nearby friends. We are trying to find the first galaxies. And since those galaxies formed almost 13 billion years ago, the universe has expanded. The light that has been emitted by those galaxies also expands. It's wavelength changes. So that's called the red shift and as you look further and further back, this is what, this is what galaxy uh, light looks like from a galaxy that was formed 11 billion years ago, okay? Notice it's basically the same as the previous thing, but all of that optical light has now shifted into the infrared. The same features pop up, but now in the infrared, okay? There's still a little light in the opticals. So maybe it's not so bad. We could still find them. Oh no, let's find a galaxy that was formed. 13 billion years ago, the first galaxy. Its optical light is wiped out because a galaxy doesn't produce much UV light, doesn't produce much ultraviolet light. And that's what we see in, in optical wavelengths because of redshift. The light from those first stars has now been redshifted into the infrared. To see those first galaxies, we need to look in the infrared. JWST is designed to find the first galaxy because of the redshift of the universe, the inescapable redshift of the universe. And so this was one of the first pictures taken by Hubble, uh, by, by JWST, of a very interesting part of the sky with a weird name, SMAX 0723. Astronomers, not very good at naming, I will freely uh, uh, admit. But what, what I want you to catch your attention here is just the sheer number of galaxies. Okay, these are all galaxies, no stars. Well, there's one bright star. The rest of are all galaxies. Uh, and there are these funny arc-shaped features. Okay, let's zoom in on one of those. You see this? This is the center of that image. These arcs 
are another astounding thing about the way the universe works. It turns out that because of the general theory of relativity, space is bent, space and time, turns out, are bent by gravity, by mass. And what you're looking at here is a gigantic cluster of galaxies in the middling distance. It's not that far away. The light from galaxies beyond this cluster has been bent. And that acts just like a lens. We call this gravitational lensing. And when you look at stuff through a, a lens, a magnifying glass, it, it changes the shape of things, right? You get these weird twisty images of things. That's what's happening here. Those arcs are actually weird twisty images of galaxies in the background, far, far away. And they're twisty because the light has been warped by, I'm trying to calculate here, 100 billion times the mass of the sun, which is what you know, each of these galaxies contain, right? That much mass has been warping the light as it passes through and producing these weird arcs. Gravitational lensing is a remarkable way to both measure the mass of these, these galaxies and also magnify. They act like telescopes, the size of clusters, uh, galaxies in the background. So this is why this object was, uh, was first imaged because it allows us to study really faint galaxies far, far away beyond the cluster. This comparison just shows you how much, how, how much better JWST is compared to Hubble. It's, it's incredibly better. We won't go into detail here. It's, it's worth looking at this in detail, uh, but um, you know, James Webb just blows Hubble out of the water. This took on the order of uh, five days to take with Hubble. This took about uh, 12 hours to take with James Webb, right? So the improvement is, is drastic. And um, this is one of the more recent uh, studies of, uh, of, of, of a region of sky uh, around, uh, around the cluster. So what you see here is a beautiful image, right? All kinds of galaxies. Every single thing here is a galaxy in the middling distance. But if you pay close attention, you start to pull out really faint things in the background. Uh, this is in behind this cluster of nearby galaxies is a cluster of galaxies at a redshift, as we call it, of eight. This is 650 million years after the Big Bang. The first cluster of galaxies forming, 650 million years after the Big Bang. This thing, if we could follow its growth to the, to the present day, would turn into some of the most massive clusters of galaxies around us. So we're looking at a proto-cluster. The first galaxies forming together in tandem. Um, dancing, merging, changing, evolving at, at a time when the universe was, uh, you know, a, 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 a child compared to what it is today, a full grown adult. Um, <clears throat> so I've talked about the two key areas of James, of JWST's, you know, design. Now I want to come back to me. <laughs> I haven't actually talked to you about why I use web. Uh, and I study, currently, I study web using, I study nearby galaxies using web, okay? Here's, again, one of the release images from JWST uh, just about six months after it was launched. Um, <clears throat> lots of beautiful information here. What I, what I, I'll just very briefly tell you what I'm trying to get from this. Uh, you know, obviously, gorgeous images. This is in the near infrared. This is in the mid infrared. They look drastically different, right? Because what you see in the mid infrared is dust. In the near infrared, you're looking at a little bit of stellar emission, all kinds of things, but this is the actual cold material. Now, all of these galaxies look interesting, you know, complex physics going on. I just want to bring your attention to this one here. It looks different from the others. In particular, it's got a very bright light in the center. Okay, there's something shining there, producing um, you know, a, a, a glint, a starry glint. That's not a star. That is a supermassive black hole that is growing and heating dust. So it's making it hotter and that's shining, brightly shining in the center of this object. We call these active galactic nuclei or AGN. 
I'll just give you an impression of what an AGN is supposed to be. This is an artist's impression of what an AGN would look like. Uh, the, the, the rough scale of what you're seeing here is about a light year. Okay, so this is the light year around the center of a galaxy. So very small scale, like a light year is less than the distance between us and the nearest star. Okay, so not a very large area of, of the galaxy. And in the very center, you see a bright spot. What's happening is gas around this region is being pulled, some of it's falling in, there's many different processes involved, but it tends to fall around the black hole and get towards the black hole, which is in the center. You can't see the black hole, right? The black hole is actually so small that you wouldn't be able to see it in this image. Instead, you see the collection of gas that's falling in. Now, a black hole is dark. No light should escape a black hole, right? By definition. It's almost like written into the laws of the universe. But that doesn't mean that there's no light around a black hole. As the gas falls in, it's falling into some of the deepest gravitational potential wells ever to exist in the universe. It's falling down, 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 losing a lot of energy in the process. So gaining a lot of energy, kinetic energy in the process. And that makes it very hot, friction. In fact, the gas that's just, just about to fall into a black hole is growing in millions of degrees. Extremely hot. And when it's extremely hot, it shines. So in fact, the most luminous things in the universe are black holes, right? The brightest things that we can see are black holes. And th that's because of gas that's falling in to these black holes, right? And that's, that's what active galaxies are. There are a broad range of them. There are some that are growing rapidly. There are some that are growing slowly. The ones that are nearby tend to be the ones that grow slowly. There's many different reasons for that. But I'm trying to study <clears throat> the gas that's falling in, that's called accretion, and the gas that's being blown out. Because when you have this huge fount of energy, some of that energy can blow stuff away, sort of like a wind. Uh, you can think of it like uh, the solar wind, right? You, you heard of the, the notion of a solar sail. If you took a big, gigantic sail and put it out in the solar system, the, the light from the sun would blow it away. The same thing can happen around these black holes, but you know, to a much, much more enhanced level. And little bits of dust and fluff that are lying around can be blown out. So these are called uh, AGN winds, and we are studying them because they contain dust. JWST allows us to see the dust, and we can see it escape the black hole. Uh, this is just a, this is not an AGN wind, but it, it's supposed to look a bit like this. That's the black hole in the center. There's a little bit of gas falling into it, but a lot of dust is being blown out. And this is an image, of course, of something that is more galactic, but it's a similar picture that you should keep in mind. And I've been studying a bunch of these nearby uh, galaxies with, with, um, with JWST. In particular, let me just show you a really pretty picture of this particular object. It's a, it's, it's a galaxy called NGC 5728. It has a really well-known black hole growing in its center. And if you look at it with JWST, you start to see all of this really beautiful knotty, knotty, as in full of knots, little blobby emission. Um, and, and what you're seeing here is, is an image made up of a JWST image in green, uh, cold, very, very cold gas in, in red. And this blue thing is quite spectacular. This almost looks like, uh, like two cones joined in the center, right? So we call this a bicone. And what we're seeing here is light that is being, that's shining from the black hole in the center into these uh, illumination cones. It's essentially uh, the direction in which this wind is blowing. You can see the wind come out into, um, you know, an hourglass shape, essentially. That's what you're seeing here. And we are trying to find, with JWST, we're trying to find the dust that's blowing in this, in this material. And I'm really happy to say that we've been able to see it. So this is just an example of it. I will. First of all, mention for, for those who are used to seeing these gorgeous images of JWST, most of the science is done with less gorgeous images, right? Um, because we're pushing the boundaries of what you can do with the data. These lovely images that you see of large chunks of, of, of the sky with all these arcs and whatnot, people then look for the faint smudges in the background. And those are the things that are the most interesting for the astronomer. 
because those are the distant galaxies. In this case as well, um, here's a gorgeous image of, uh, of, of, of this object. I'm looking in the very center for a little smudge coming out in the same direction as this hourglass shape. That is dust that's being blown out from the center. We're seeing it for the first time. And in case you're wondering why we need web to do it, here's an image of the same object taken from Hubble. There's so much dust in the way that it's completely obscured. With JWST, we can peer through the dust that's obscuring and see the dust that's flowing out. So we have a different uh, picture of this object. And we're actually seeing the impact of uh, the, the black hole on the dust that's flowing out. Why is this interesting? Just dust blowing out of a black hole. The black hole is the most powerful thing in every galaxy. It is the most efficient engine in the universe. Um, it can take a little bit of material that falls in and smack it out with high energy all out through the galaxy. It changes a galaxy's life. And we are part of a galaxy's life, right? The coal gas, the dust, all of that is connected to the evolution of life in a galaxy. Black holes are known to change the amount of stars that form in a galaxy. They halt star formation. Future life in the universe can be halted because black holes prevent those stars from forming, okay? That's part of the process that I'm trying to understand by looking at these black holes with JWST. So I just want to get a sense of how much time you have left. Just about down five minutes, okay. Um, I do have a bunch of, of slides on the technology of JWST and it can be rather complicated. So I'd rather not go into it. Let me just briefly tell you about the, the, the technology of JWST. Um, the way it works with these uh, observatories is you have a, a telescope, right? a big thing that collects light. And then the light comes in and is focused onto a bunch of instruments. The instruments are the actual eyes. The telescope is the, are the spectacles, right? But the instruments are where the light is collected and all kinds of interesting science can be done with the instruments. Now with the space telescope, there are no humans behind those instruments. But they had to be essentially robotic instruments. Makes them rather complicated. There's four instruments, five technically, because one of them is a double instrument uh, on JWST looking at different wavelengths. So near cam looks out to about five microns. MIRI looks from about five to 28 microns. MIRI is the unique instrument that was built uh, partly by people at Edinburgh. So Edinburgh has a lot, long, large claim to the kind of science that can be done with MIRI. Um, and I just wanted to give you a sense of how complicated this is. So this is the simplest instrument on JWST. And what you're seeing here is just a visualization of how the light moves through this instrument. So it already looks like a complicated little thing. Um, and if you wait, can I make that move away? Yeah, I can. So that's light coming in, it's reflecting on through some mirrors, it's passing into the instrument itself, and um, it's reflected again and again and again, 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 and then finally ends up on a camera. And you can change the colors uh, of the light. These are filters that block different kinds of light from passing through. This is the simplest instrument <laughs> on JWST. What I want to bring to your attention is this instrument has to operate, this instrument in fact, in particular, has to operate at about four degrees Kelvin, so minus 260 degrees Celsius with lots of moving parts, regularly moving. You cannot use oil at minus 270 degrees. Lubrication does not exist. You have to do this using extremely good engineering and essentially having frictional uh, control over the movement of an object. So if something doesn't quite touch something else, the instrument will not work. Right? It has to be done to such a such tolerances that you shouldn't let one piece block something else and you shouldn't pre allow one thing to not quite touch something else. Otherwise, the instrument will not work. It has to go on like this for 20 years, okay? This is an extremely precise instrument. It takes a lot of work to build this and a lot of technology to test it. 
Uh, and this is the simplest out of all of them in there. Um, the more instruments you have, the more complex. Um, I, I'll, I'll, uh, what I'm going to do is, since we don't have too much time, uh, I'll just skip all of this. Really, it's all kind of cute. Uh, I just want to show you how, how it initially worked. Remember all of this unfolding? So what, what people did with web was uh, they took some time to align it. So about, about a month or so after web was launched, it was in its final position. And the telescope was, was open and was ready to go, but it wasn't yet a telescope because the, the various little segments on that mirror were not aligned. Each of them acted as a single different telescope mirror. And if you took a picture of a star, that's what you got. That doesn't look like a star. Each of those points is a different image of the star pointed at, because the, the, the mirrors are pointed at different parts of the sky. There's a process of alignment, which took most of those six months uh, in order to get the telescope to act like a single telescope. And then at the end of it, that same star looked like this, right? Six months later, we got this image where all of the uh, optical elements are aligned and perfectly set up to, to produce the image of the star. And lo and behold, behind the star are those galaxies that we've been waiting for you know, 26 years to see with Webb. And there they are, sitting behind the star. Uh, and every single picture that you ever take with Webb will show some gorgeous faint galaxies in the background. Um, you know, they did it not just for one instrument, they've done it for all of them. I just want to give you a sense of how much better Webb is compared to the best thing before. So there were, there were um, infrared telescopes in space before. Spitzer is the classic one. That's the, the best you can get with Spitzer. That's the best you can get with Webb. And the, the improvement is drastic. Right? This is our view of the infrared universe before Webb. This is what we have now. And um, uh, it's, it's clear enough to say that Webb is one of the most incredible leaps in infrared astronomy that, you know, was planned and has happened. There's, we're not gonna have anything like Webb for a while. That kind of jump happens maybe once in a lifetime. And I'm really proud to be sitting in the front of that whole process, you know, actually taking part in the process. So I'm just, just gonna end with one of the most gorgeous pictures uh, from Webb. So this is the one year anniversary press release um, of, of, of a region called Ro uh, a very famous part of the sky. And I tried my best, <laughs> I tried my best to track down exactly, oh, that's my timer, that's an hour. I tried my best to track down exactly which optical part of the sky looked like, and I couldn't find it, I just couldn't. It, <laughs> it's actually, um, it looks nothing like the, the part of the sky that we see in, with our eyes. But just look at this gorgeous, gorgeous complexity. I mean, there are, there are wisps of dust and gas that, that, that are seen in gorgeous detail. You, you, what you see here are, are outflows, jets of molecular coal gas being blown out of the star in the center. Uh, and there's all kinds of remarkable, remarkable detail uh, that we just would not ever have seen before. And this is one of the most well-studied parts of the sky. Uh, it's a fitting anniversary picture, present from Webb. Webb is going to be in operation for another 20 years if everything goes well. So it is not my telescope. It is the telescope of, of my students, my future, my, the, the next generation of astronomers, and maybe more generations beyond. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed that talk. Um, I will have, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, and, uh, you know, I hope this allows, this, this sets you up so that the next time you see something gorgeous coming from JWST in the news, you know, can know a little bit about it. So you can tell people, tell the world how fantastic web is. Thank you. David, that was mind blowing. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. I'm reeling with the excitement of it all. Now we've got about 25 minutes of questions and we've got two roving mics. So uh, are you willing to take some questions, David? Absolutely. How's your throat? Do you want to? <laughs> I think water is just fine. Have water. I might, I might just you know, choke on this if I try. <laughs> <laughs> we've got plenty of water. We've got the mics here. 
I'm recovering from a cold, and thankfully, I think I just coughed once. So that's uh, that's a good good situation to be in. Okay. Let's work. Okay, who's with the first question? <clears throat> Yeah, at the front, look. Yeah, behind you. Uh, I was wondering how artificial intelligence is going to, what role artificial intelligence will play on the James Webb telescope. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, at some level, there's already artificial intelligence in the sense that this is essentially a robot in space. So there's some level of AI involved. Um, but let me give you an example of, of, what, of how it might work. I just go back to... Um, yeah, okay. so, you know, um, yeah, why not? Let's take a look at this, right? So these are galaxies, okay? Galaxies are, uh, for the longest time, astronomers have treated galaxies as simple objects, blurs of light with a certain shape. They aren't. That's not a simple set of objects, especially when you're looking at different wavelengths and looking at a different picture of these galaxies. And what we've depended upon for a long time is for people to look at these images and say, okay, that's kind of like this, this is kind of like that classification of galaxies has been done by, by humans visually. The problem with web is that these are all galaxies, right? Even in this single picture, there are thousands of galaxies, all of them with the same degree of complexities. Uh, when you, you know, zoom in, in detail, like those little pictures on the side there. So how do we understand the structure of these galaxies? Um, it turns out that classification is a very important first step, figuring out whether it, it looks you know, elongated or disk shape or sense, centrally concentrated, tells you about how the galaxy has evolved, tells you about its history. And so it's an important first step is classifying. We have enormous um, uh, amounts of work done right now. Um, there's a huge push to figure out ways to classify galaxies using AI, as an example, right? So AI's strengths is taking something that traditionally has been done by humans, boring work in many ways, fraught with error, and taking all of that work in, in order to train computers to do the same thing with the same level of accuracy. So classification of galaxies is an example of something that we, that we are now pushing to, with web data to do. There's obviously many, many areas where AI can help uh, astronomers. So I, for example, I have, um, my student is doing, is, is training neural networks to uh, figure out what galaxies are made of. What fraction of them are stars? What fraction of it is, is AGN light? What fraction is like coal dust from star formation? This is another example of what AI can do. Hello, that, that was fascinating. Thank you. At the beginning, you told us how many organizations were involved in actually producing the telescope. But you've since talked as if it's your telescope. <laughs> so the question is, how many people are using the telescope and you have to book time on it or something? I good question. Very good question. It's not always obvious how these telescopes are actually used. Uh, let me tell you, it's a very complicated process. Uh, so anyone can use the James Webb Space Telescope. It's an international resource that's open to anyone to use. In reality, if you don't know what you're doing, it's almost impossible to use, right? So uh, every, I think once a year, this year there were two of these, they, they put out a call for proposals where groups get together, generally, and write a case, a detailed case. And when, when they, but this, these cases are complicated. You, it's not just a scientific question. You need to demonstrate, you know exactly what you're doing. You need to tell the people that run the telescope exactly how to set up the telescope to take your, your data. 
And then you need to convince them that even after doing all of that, you will get a result. You will get the science done. Um, th that requires a lot of planning. Uh, and then about one in five of those proposals gets time because they're so heavily oversubscribed by the astronomical community. So it's, 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 a, it's not easy getting web time. Uh, with Gatos as an example, we tried three times. There were calls before the first year of James Webb observing, we, so, which we tried for, and we didn't get that time. So after three tries, we ended up getting our proposals in. And it's still about one to five. So we actually put in, for every two proposals we get, we put in 10. <laughs> Each of them as complex as what I've just described. Uh, so yeah, that's how it's done. Um, it, it's, it's an international process of applying, proposing, and, and uh, review before you get to actually taking the data. <laughs> that was fascinating. Uh, thank you for that talk. Can you tell me what the spikes are coming out of the bright objects? Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> that's just, that's basically optics. So um, if you remember the shape of JWST, I might as well just go to the beginning. Um, so the light that comes in and hits the, um, the mirror is partially blocked by those spikes. Right, these, um, these things that hold the secondary mirror. So light comes in through here, then reflects off that mirror, goes in through here, and goes in through another bunch of mirrors before it actually gets to those instruments that I showed you at the end. So there's a lot of, a lot of twisting and turning of the light before it gets through. Each of these steps affects the quality of the light a little bit. It adds features to the light. This is an inescapable uh, optical phenomenon called diffraction. We can't escape it. And diffraction is what produces those spikes. The reason you have those six-sided spikes is because the mirror is made up of hexagons. So the shape of each of these little um, structures imposes itself on the light that every single object there uh, you know, uh, appears to have. So you, we try to get the light to the, to the center as much as possible, but some, some of it escapes and it doesn't escape in all directions. It escapes along certain patterns, which is what those spikes are. We call those diffraction spikes. You will see them in images of any telescope, uh, any space telescope. If you, in the ground, it, there are other processes at play, but any space telescope will show you diffraction spikes. And JWC has them as well. You know, you talked about the dust. What exactly does it consist of? Ah. Okay, so yeah, I mean, obviously this is a, a big question for astronomers because we are trying to figure it out as well. Um, <clears throat> we know just from the chemistry of, of the light that we see coming from this dust. So the, the light comes from the dust. We work out what its chemistry is based on that. We know that a large fraction of it is made up of either carbon or silicates. So actually quite similar to the dust, to, to chemicals we're used to dealing with uh, on Earth. Uh, the carbonaceous stuff is primarily soot. Actually, it is very much similar in composition to uh, cigarette smoke, like I, like I mentioned, even in terms of the consistency. So it's very fine particles of soot. Where does that come from? Stars. As stars go through the late stages in their lives, they pump out. As they cool down, they, they convert helium, uh, uh, they, that's hydrogen, helium, then oxygen, nitrogen, car carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, produce different kinds of uh, atoms, uh, elements in the center. The carbon in, in particular comes out, intersects with nitrogen and oxygen, turns into soot, gets oxidized, and you get soot escaping these stars, flying out into space. For the past 13 billion years, stars have been puffing soot out into space. And that's what we see as dust. Some of it is, is silicate. silicate. Silicon is also quite uh, frequently produced in stars. Silicon inter inter interacts with oxygen really well and produces silicates. That's the stuff that we use to dust on Earth. Right, M much of the Earth's crust is made up of silicates, uh, so it's the same material. Yeah. You said you said it took uh, NASA took some like twenty six years or something to plan the James Webb Telescope. Are they already planning the next one? And yes. if so, what's it going to be like? And are you going to be involved? You might not be here then, but 
So yeah, yes, they are. They are absolutely planning the next one, and and not just just started. They've been planning it for the past decade, right? So there's something coming up soon called W first or uh, the Roman Space Observatory, which is a different thing from JWST. It's actually going to survey the sky, so it's going to produce Hubble Space Telescope images, equivalent images across most of the sky. This is pretty remarkable. Uh, um, uh, operation and the reason that you can you they want to do this is because if you can study the shapes of galaxies and how they change across the sky, you can map dark matter. It's quite a remarkable thing. So the primary aim for Roman is to be able to map the invisible universe by looking at how light is bent by 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 mass as it passes through. Quite quite spectacular, but you need Hubble Space Telescope like images across the entire sky. Beyond that, there are other plans. They will be two decades in the future, probably, uh, to, to, to build another big space telescope, essentially, similar to Webb, but, but in the, probably in the ultraviolet, as opposed to in the infrared. I mean, yes. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that, although you lost me on page two. <laughs> uh, however, I, I came back again towards the end. And when you were discussing black holes, yeah. you said that JWST could see the dust. Yeah. But at the start, JWST's virtue was that it didn't, it could look through the dust. Oh, so yeah. when did we suddenly become visible dust as opposed yeah. to invisible dust? So JWST looks through the dust that is cold and blocking and sees the dust that's warm and shining. Why? Because the dust that's warm and shining is warmer. That's it, right? J JWST is sensitive to the temperature of what it's seeing. It's literally a giant infrared camera. That's what it is, right? And so when the dust is shining brightly, then it can be seen. When the dust is cold, it doesn't shine brightly, and then JWST can look right through it. And if you want to think of, uh, think of it, uh, imagine that, um, you know, that, that big plastic sheet that I showed you, right? The reason that you can see me through it is because I'm hotter than the plastic sheet. If the plastic sheet was warmer than me, it would shine brighter than me, and you wouldn't see me so clearly through it. You see what I mean? The perspex sheet is, is blocks light. So it's a different chemical process altogether. It literally prevents light from going through. It's like looking through a brick wall. Um, it doesn't matter. What's happening to what's happening to the stuff beyond the big one? Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, have you got any questions? Yes, I've uh, got a question online. It is claimed there are too many large galaxies at very early times, or more than expected. Can you say anything about this? Yes. So people are finding what we call really massive galaxies in the early universe, and the reason why this is surprising is because. It takes time to produce stars. Uh, and there's just not, as far as we know, not quite enough time to produce enough stars to make a galaxy that's um, you know, 10 billion solar masses. So essentially 10 billion stars have formed in one tiny part of the, gal of, of the universe within a few hundred million years. It's a remarkable amount of, 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 of uh, star formation, which physically shouldn't happen, OK? It's not the end of the world. We're not talking about changing fundamental physics. I think it's, it's, it comes down to, at least at this point, it comes down to, do we understand really well how galaxies form, how stars form in those environments? Keep in mind that in the early universe, there, were no, there, were, there was only hydrogen helium. So we call this pristine gas. There, were no, uh, car, there was no carbon, no nitrogen, no oxygen. What these other elements do is that they allow gas to cool. Basically, they allow light to escape uh, gas. And if gas gets cool, then it, it fragments and it changes the nature of the way the stars form. So we are still learning a little bit about how 
astrophysics should work in those pristine times when there were no elements beyond hydrogen and helium. Uh, and, and this may be the, 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 the thing that tells us how to form stars with such intensity. There may be other factors at play. Um, people have talked about cosmic strings, which can produce point defects essentially in space time. There's all kinds of explanations. We don't know yet, but it's pushing the boundaries now of how well we understand star formation uh, at those early times based on JWST's um, results. So, you know, stay tuned. We're learning a lot. <clears throat> you mentioned that there were um, like a sort of beauty parade every year as to who would get their projects working. Once these are set, can other people piggyback on them? Can you watch what's happening all the time? Or is it exclusive to whoever has instigated it? Yes. And not, not the same question, but is there a time lag between what's actually happening on the telescope and getting the information back here? Yes, very good, very good questions. Uh, so if you don't request it, uh, every person that proposes, every team, has a year of proprietary access to the data, which means the data is taken, put into the archive, and based on your credentials, you can, you're the only person that can access it, okay? However, some people might say, I want to take data that the entire community can use, and I can waive my proprietary access. And that's in, indeed done. There are certain sets of proposals that require to be completely public from day one. So the data comes uh, into the telescope, Within the, the data comes down to Earth twice a day. It's, it's basically archived, processed, and it's usually available to astronomers within two days after being taken. Uh, that's just to ensure that the quality of the data is correct and all kinds of things are done. And then anyone can use them. Anyone here can go to the JWST archive, type in your favorite object, and see if there's data for it. And if there is data, download it and use it. Problem, of course, is that astronomical data requires a lot of background to use. Uh, the data is not as pretty as the pictures that you see. Those, those pictures have, uh, have been processed to take out all kinds of uh, instrument defects, to take out um, uh, issues with, 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 with varying amounts of heat in the telescope. Those are called thermal backgrounds. All of that has to be dealt with by a process called calibration. And then at the end of it, you get an image which you can do science from. Those are the images that you see there. Um, so anyone can download this data. Uh, it, it takes an astronomer's training to be able to get science out of the data. Right. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, is there a directional restriction on the way the telescope can look? And related question is, what can you tell us about the homogeneity or otherwise of the universe and what that means? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, so, so yes, there is a directionality. It has to face away from the sun, right? That, that's the minimal requirement. So the telescope can point at any, essentially any part of the sky away from the sun. So half of the sky at any given time. Um, a little bit of slop because it goes in that big orbit. But over the course of the year, it can look at the entire sky, right? So as it goes around the sun, it basically can access any point of the sky. So in many ways, it's kind of like a typical telescope, in a ground-based telescope, because we can't observe the sky in the daytime. We have to wait a year or half a year before we, before we can observe the same part of the sky in the night. You see what I mean? Uh, it's a similar deal with JWST. Now, homogeneity of the universe. Um, there is no, currently there are no observations from Webb that, that suggest that the universe is different from, you know, our primary model for it, which is homogeneous and is isotropic. Um, if there are any deviations from homogeneity or isotropicity, as you say, basically it's the same in all directions, uh, it, they're very minor. Webb is not the best instrument to test this, because Webb, JWST, looks at a tiny part of the sky. And to understand homogeneity, you actually need to look at a large chunk of the sky and compare it to a large chunk of the sky in the opposite direction. You see what I mean? That's what the Roman Space Telescope is designed to do. So the next thing that I mentioned, 
that one of its aims is to very finely understand uh, the cosmological assumptions, the cosmological principles of homogeneity and isotropicity, for example, and other things. Well, have you got any more questions? Uh, yes, another online question. How accurate are the estimates of age from redshift at early times? Um, the age of the universe? I'm not quite sure, but I'll, I'll answer as I, as I interpret the question. Um, so the age of the universe is tied to our model for how the universe has evolved. So the start of the Big Bang, what the universe is made of, how it's expanded. That is actually in pretty good shape in the sense that the various observations that we made have shown us that the universe behaves a certain way. And then if you know the redshift of an object, you pretty much know uh, at what time in the universe's history you're seeing that object to an accuracy that's, you know, a few percent, okay? There's a second statement about age. How old are the stars that you see in a particular galaxy? That's not the same as how old the universe is because the universe could have started at some point at the Big Bang, but it takes many years before the first stars form, right? So you see a galaxy, how old are those stars? Those are extremely uncertain. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we might be off by a factor of five for, for some of that sum. So there's a lot of uncertainty in the exact uh, statements there, uh, how old the stars are that one sees. Um, it's easier for some galaxies, harder for other kinds of galaxies. That's astrophysics for you, right? We we've gradually improve our, our assumptions, our priors, our modeling, so that we can tie these numbers down more accurately, but it's not easy to do. It might be a fairly simplistic question, but when we talk about the Big Bang, is there a direction of it? It's a very complicated question, <laughs> not a simplistic question, because um, you know our our the way that we think about the world is is tied to some reference frame. Our reference frame is in in our case generally is the Earth, right? For example, so there's a directionality to everything towards the Earth, away from the Earth, for example. Um, <clears throat> one should think about the fact that the universe has expanded, maybe that'll help us think a little more about whether there's a direction to it. Let's say that the universe started off in something this small, right? The Big Bang in, in co was, was everything within my hand, right? That, the entire chunk of space within my hand went through a Big Bang. It's now expanded to the size of the universe. So every point in space went through the Big Bang. It's just that the universe has expanded since. And that's the way you should be thinking about it. Every single point in space experienced the Big Bang, uh, but the universe has expanded since. So we don't, we shouldn't be thinking of a, a static universe and then a certain point where the Big Bang happened. Space itself was formed in the Big Bang. What exists outside it? Oh, we're starting to go into to rather complicated regimes dealing with multidimensional mathematics and uh, descriptions of curved universes, etc. In the, simplest, in the simplest way, nothing exists beyond it because everything was produced at the Big Bang, right? But we, our, our brain is designed to only think about the three-dimensional universe. So we don't, can't imagine what that is like. But that mathematically is completely normal to have something that doesn't exist into which something has, is expanding. I'm not into it. See, again, my, my terminology is wrong. We don't expand into it. The universe is, Expanding. <laughs> last question. Gentlemen here, the last question. Do you believe in God? Oh, gosh, <laughs> my goodness me. <laughs> so there's two, there's two, there's two um, answers to that, right? There's a simple answer, which is yes or no. I'll be very frank, I do not believe in God. Uh, even more important to that is, where is God? How does one appreciate uh, the existence of a higher power 
within the universe as we know. And that also varies between how people um, you know, approach, approach these things. There are some people that feel that um, a higher power is, insinuates themselves into our lives. It's an integral part of the way that we live our lives, the, that, that people, the universe exists, right? There are some people that imagine that the creator was a creator, purely a creator. Something started, they made physics, and then the universe evolved according to physics, right? Initial conditions. Um, if I were to be religious, <laughs> I would still take on the philosophical point of, of, of believing in a creator rather than seeing um, a, a divine hand in everything that happens around. It's a question of belief. And that's the most important thing for me, right? Uh, I believe that physics operates the way it does. That's a very important assumption for, for me as a physicist. Is there evidence that it doesn't? It's tricky. There may be, there may not be, right? It depends whether you take certain kinds of evidence as solid or not. Um, so there is a level of assumption involved in being a physicist as I am. But everything that I do does not require the presence of God for it to happen. You see what I mean, right? Or a divine hand being an integral part of the physics itself. Hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> the simple answer is I don't. <laughs> David, I think uh, it's time to wrap up a most exciting an interesting talk we've had for ages, and I want to thank you enormously. Two final things. In two weeks' time, we have another type of explorer, Stephen Venables and Everest. And that's going to be another exciting adventure. Please come. And the second announcement is there's a glass of wine at the back of the hall. Please join us and please join David tonight. Thank you. <laughs>